Howdy folks, it's time for the weekly Steampunk Desperado quiz. Now don't worry, it's multiple choice, so it'll be easy, right? The question is, what is the Crystal Palace? The answers, A, a notorious Amsterdam drug den, B, a museum built by Grammy Award winning female country singer Crystal Gale, C, a 21st century electro swing musical group, or D, a remarkable exhibition hall constructed in 19th century London. For the answers, see after the intro. And the answer is, of course, D. That remarkable exhibition hall built in 19th century London. Now, London is the preeminent setting for steampunk novels. In particular, well, of course, not every steampunk novel is a what I call a historical steampunk novel. Many take place in alternate worlds with a kind of Victorian feel to the society or the technology. But for those that do focus on historical era, London is the place because it was the largest city in the world for the entire 19th century. It was a place of great contrasts from squalor and poverty to splendor, wealth, and great accomplishments. And one of the most splendid accomplishments was the Crystal Palace. Now this was a huge building constructed in Hyde Park to house the Great Exhibition of 1851. Now, where did the name come from? It seems like an obvious name for a building mostly built of glass, but I couldn't find any authoritative confirmation of who named it. There is a rumor, however, that it was named by a satirical article in the magazine Punch, where the playwright Douglas Gerald said, he was writing about the upcoming exhibition, and he said, it's going to be a palace of very crystal. In fact, it was a brainchild of a number of British entrepreneurs and industrialists and spearheaded by none other than Prince Albert, the, the uh, royal consort and husband of Queen Victoria. And he chaired a royal commission to create this exhibition. And of course, to, for the exhibition, they had to have a place to hold it. And then there was nothing that was big or grand enough so they decided to build something entirely new and they went to Hyde Park and looked for a designer. Now among, uh, among the things that were popular at that time were glass structures. They had a big boom in these because England had repealed the glass tax. And what this was is buildings were taxed per window <laughs> because I don't know, I guess it was considered to be a, an indication of how much the building was worth, which had some pernicious effects, including, including like encouraging people to build buildings with very few windows. <laughs> so uh, when they repealed this, they started building fabulous glass houses. And one of the people who built these was Joseph Paxton. And he was a great horticulturalist. So naturally he became a designer of greenhouses. And his patron was the Duke of Devonshire, who was, who was just crazy about tropical plants. Paxton was his head gardener, and he would, uh, he would get all of these things to grow in England that nobody else had gotten to grow, like giant Amazon water lilies, for example. They were so big that you can stand on them. And so naturally, his idea was to build it of glass. Plate glass had recently become cheaper, making it possible. And this was an incredibly impressive structure. 1,851 feet long, 128 feet high, nearly a million square feet of exhibition space, three times the size of St. Paul's Cathedral, which was definitely one of the biggest structures in London. The exhibition itself lasted for only six months in the year of 1851. From May Day, May 1st, to October 15th, it was kicked off, of course, by a visit from Queen Victoria. So the first few weeks, Ticket prices were very high to kind of keep out the riffraff so that the aristocratic, the upper classes could visit without the annoyance of the 
ordinary people. But shortly after that, they dropped them dramatically, so everybody could afford to go, just about. And in the course of these six months, six million people visited. One of the things that made this possible was the recent building of all these railroads in England. It was a big railroad boom and people were, could easily and cheaply travel from one part of the country to the other and people indeed came from other parts of the world. It was sort of a, a precursor to the modern tourism industry where people would come from other places to see something. Also a landmark in commercialism and advertising and marketing because all these companies brought their biggest and best to impress the public. And one of the most impressive impressive things was actually owned by Queen Victoria. It was the koh i -Noor diamond. It was the world's biggest diamond and she acquired it from the Indian Kingdom of Punjab in 1848. So a lot of people came just to see this diamond. But of course there was a lot of other amazing things to see. There were huge blocks of coal. They had large steam locomotives, hydraulic presses, and steam hammers. They had wondrous machines like sewing machines, ice making machines, cigarette rolling machines. They had a scale model of Liverpool pool docks with a thousand miniature ships with full rigging. It's just incredible, amazing things for people to see. And they tried to discourage the most blatant commercialism. Merchants were not allowed to display their prices or sell things directly over the counter. But of course they found a way a way around that and they invented a thing called the sales brochure. <laughs> they were handing these out like crazy. And a lot of the displays and the uh, signs and stuff that they had, they led to the modern advertising industry such as billboards and department store window displays. Also, the Great Ex Exhibition kicked off an era of world's fairs and exhibitions where different countries and cities tried to outdo each other and make it grander and grander, which kind of culminated in the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. Now, there were other World's Fairs after that, but it was not, it, you know, it kind of declined in, uh, in popularity. Yeah, I guess it's lost its novelty. Of course, sadly, the uh, 1851 exhibition was very short, and after it closed, they had this big building and they didn't know what to do with it. So a group of businessmen got together and they decided, let's buy this thing and build it back someplace else. So they acquired some property at the top of Sydenham Hill in what used to be Penge Common of the village of Penge. An <laughs> interesting name. And in, back in the day, there were a lot of these common areas in England. Farmers would eke out a living in these. And that came to a close with the Enclosures Act where the English government actually took over these things, subdivided them, and uh, drove a lot of these people off the land, which ended up driving them into cities right at the time when the Industrial Revolution needed factory workers. That's an in another interesting topic that I may have to cover. Interesting and partly tragic. Anyway, when they rebuilt the Crystal Palace in the new Crystal Palace Park on Sydenham Hill, they didn't rebuild it exactly the same. Now the facade was similar, so it looked a lot like the old one, but it was in other ways completely different. It was redesigned and enlarged, <clears throat> made it made more roomy inside, if you can believe that. It was now 16, 1,608 by 384 feet, so it was even bigger, and it was completed in two years, and once again Queen Victoria came to open it up. And on that opening day alone, there were 40,000 guests. Over the years, uh, during its lifetime, the Crystal Palace housed many concerts and public events, gatherings of all sorts, <laughs> and they had an orchestra hall with a pipe organ with 4,500 pipes. Just amazing. As a keyboardist, I would love to be able to play such a thing. I mean, the best, occasionally I've gotten to play one in a church or in the practice hall back in my college, and it was always a great thrill. It's like a feeling of power. Now the park itself, the park they built around the Crystal Palace was even more amazing and expensive. <laughs> they had an Italian garden and fountains that shot water up in the air. They had the Great Maze. They had an English landscape garden. And most awesome, in my view, was the Dinosaur Park, where they had 33 dinosaur sculptures, uh, not at full, full life size, 
but I think at scale. And these were designed by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And not all of them were actual dinosaurs. Some were other prehistoric lizards like uh, plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs. And they had some exotic extinct mammals from the Cenozoic era. Now, of course, many of the dinosaurs were wrong because <laughs> they had just started to research this. And so they had only a few bones here and there. And as, just for one example, the Megalosaurus was portrayed as a quadruped when in reality, at least scientists believe now, that he walked on two legs like T-Rex. So this dinosaur park is still there and I would love to see it sometime. I've only been to London once and it was a very brief visit and didn't get to see much. But the Crystal Palace, very sadly, is no longer there. It was destroyed in a fire in 1936. I guess it started in the cloakroom and all the employees tried to put it out. They were unsuccessful and the whole thing, well, most of it was destroyed. And you wonder, it was glass. How did fire destroy it? Well, there was a lot of wood inside there, and of course, when all that wood's burning, that heat's going to destroy the metal and glass structure. So most of it fell down, even though the, you know, the fire crews tried to save it. And there was a north tower that remained, and that was intentionally destroyed in 1941 because the British authorities were worried that the uh, Nazi bombers would be using it to target London during the Blitz. There were some conspiracy theories about the destruction of the Crystal Palace, particularly from a guy named John Logie Baird, who was an engineer and a pioneer in the new field of television. He was working on that at a facility that he rented in the Crystal Palace, and he thought that maybe somebody sabotaged it to stop his work in television. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they foresaw the maybe they foresaw the uh, cultural degradation, or maybe it was a competitor. Who knows? But probably not. It was probably just an accident. At least the Crystal Palace name is still in existence. That's what they call this neighborhood of London, no longer called Penge, which is kind of a funny name anyway. They also have a football stadium that is soccer. So of course there's a Crystal Palace football club. There have been a few attempts to rebuild the actual structure, including a recent one in 2013 by a Chinese firm. Of course it would be the Chinese. They're the ones who have this grand vision these days, but it didn't happen. Uh, whatever, you know, financial problems or whatever. And uh, so sadly it hasn't yet be re been rebuilt, but it would be really awesome if it was to have this kind of indoor space in the cold environs of London where you could raise, we could have more tropical type Foliage, for example, because it is essentially, or it was, a, just a giant greenhouse with a lot of space for other things inside. There are, are a few other facilities associated with the Crystal Palace, including uh, a couple museums near Hyde Park. It was originally called the South Kensington Museum, which was built with proceeds from the Great Exhibition. It is now two museums. One is the Science Museum, and across the road is the Victoria and Albert Museum, celebrating the uh, royal couple. Now, why did they have this great exhibition in 1851, besides, you know, trying to make money? Well, there are other reasons as well. One is that this was kind of a time of turmoil, and uh, the authorities may have wanted to distract people from that and make them think, yes, the world is getting better, you don't have to revolt, because <laughs> there were several popular rebellions across Europe at the time in 1848 from uh, Ireland, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and although they didn't, to my knowledge, overthrow countries, they had been, did eventually get the governments to have some liberal reforms. In England they had the Chartist movement, which wanted to have a people's charter, kind of give the normal people more rights, and eventually some of their platform was implemented. So. In a way, it was a way it was a celebration of the power of the British Empire, but it was also a kind of a distraction thrown to the public to say, "Here is something that shows that we are making progress." Of course, the exhibition has a lot of symbolic significance to that era as a, as a theme of progress. Many writers at the time saw it that way. In particular, Russian writers found it interesting. Uh, for example, Nikolai Chernevsky in his novel, What is to be Done, which I have not read. <laughs> and unfortunately, I haven't read many of these at all that I'm referencing in this segment. One that I have read, however, 
is the Sherlock Holmes stories in which the Baker Street Irregulars, those uh, street children that often help Sherlock Holmes during his investigations, uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, they often meet with him at the Crystal Palace. And so it's not as big of a thing in steampunk as you would think. Now you would think this, this would occur, this, that this place would be featured in a lot of steampunk novels. And I was thinking that too when I first envisioned this as a segment, but when I thought back to it, there really weren't very many. Even though a lot of these take place in historical or quasi-historical London. One exception is there's some short stories, for, that, for example, by Genevieve Valentine, uh, from the catalog of the Pavilion of the Uncanny and Marvelous, which has some fanciful ideas of exhibits they might have had for a little bit more occult and arcane things. This appeared in Queen Victoria's Book of Spells, a very awesome story collection. I'll have to talk about story collections in a later video. It appears in several historical fiction books, uh, but my favorite is, of course, the time travel novel by Neil Stevenson and Nicole Gallard, The Rise and Fall of D.O.D.O., which focuses on a U.S. government agency that actually sends this woman back in time <laughs> to right around the time of the Great Exhibition because this is what destroyed magic. This triumph of technology made magic finally go away, and, and basically the U.S. government wants to bring it back <laughs> so that they can use it for their own ends. And so it was that, it was the exhibition, and it was also the solar eclipse of July 1851, which was photographed for the first time, which, which made magic go away. It's a common theme you see in fantasy novels where, where magic was real in the past but isn't now. There are other more normal historical novels, including the following. Death of the Crystal Palace by Jennifer Ashley. Uh, the Corpse of the Crystal Palace by Carol Ed Dunn. A Death at Crystal Palace by Caroline Denford, and Sherlock Holmes and the Crystal Palace Murder by Joanna M. Rieke. Notice the common theme. And there's one more I want to have reference. Uh, Professor Ion D. and the Epicurean Incident, which also involves a murder at the Crystal Palace by none other than yours truly and Mrs. Desperado. Ours is as a proper steampunk, because we have gadgets and stuff, and the professor who travels around. She's an expert on not only antiquities, but on cooking. And in our book, we have a fictional exhibition of British cooking, believe it or not. Kind of, almost kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke, where uh, there's a conspiracy against, against the king, <laughs> which uh, Ion D has to help solve this mystery. So that was a lot of fun. And we had, actually hadn't read any of these other books at the time. We weren't even aware of them. But I may go back and read some of them later on and see how they are. One book that is not a murder mystery that I found online was The Crystal Palace, The Diary of Lily Hicks, London, 1850-1851 by Frances Mary Hendry, who talks about a young girl who was involved, uh, um, who was present at the time that the uh, Crystal Palace was being built. Of course, there are a number of non-fiction books about the history of the exhibition and the palace. There is a historical society dedicated to the Crystal Palace. Uh, I will put the link in the description below where you, can, where, where you can get some of the books that involve the Crystal Palace and the, also the history of the village of Penge, of course. Now, one more thing I have to go into because I love these giant glass edifices and one of the ones that I've actually gotten to see is the Biosphere 2 here in Arizona near the town of Oracle. Because when I saw it a few years ago, it made me think of the Crystal Palace and the similarities between the two. Now, they don't look anything the same. The Biosphere 2 is, of course, very modernistic, and it is not a, an exhibition hall, but a research facility in order to for, have several people live in isolation uh, in kind of a closed ecosystem, Biosphere 1 being the Earth, of course. The idea is, can we do a space colony with people just living on plants and animals in a closed system that would recycle their air as well, you know, with the oxygen from the plants? Not sure it's as relevant to my channel, but I just wanted to mention it because it's a great glass structure that's very impressive, and interestingly enough, as big as it is, 
it was only one-fifth the size of the Great Crystal Palace, <laughs> with only 142,000 square feet inside. No wonder the people in, in, that lived in there went kind of stir-crazy and started having quarrels and all that stuff. But that's all I have to say for now about the Great Exhibition in the Crystal Palace. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think about, about this in the comments below, and if you have any other historical or fictional topics or books you'd like me to talk about, or movies or whatever. And uh, please like and subscribe so we can get out the good steampunk gospel and let more and more people know about this and keep history alive as well. That's one of my other missions. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank <laughs> you.